In this tape, the first of two on the anatomy of the head and neck, we'll look first at the structures involved in support and movement of the head, then at the facial skeleton and base of the skull, then at the structures involved in breathing, eating, swallowing, and speaking. In the second tape, we'll look at the blood vessels of the head and neck, then at the brain, the cranial nerves, the ear, and the eye. As in other parts of the body, understanding the bones provides the foundation for everything else we need to learn. The skull is such a complicated piece of bony anatomy that we won't try to understand all of it at once. Instead, we'll build up our picture of it a little at a time in the course of this tape. In each section, we'll add the parts of the skull that are new to the parts that we've seen already. In that way, we'll end up with a complete picture. In this first section, we'll look at the way the head is attached to the body and how it moves. We'll start by looking at the bones that are involved, then we'll look at the joints and ligaments that connect them. After that, we'll look at the muscles that maintain the position of the head and cause it to move. The bones that are involved in support and movement of the head are the thoracic and cervical vertebrae, the upper ribs, the clavicles, and this part of the underside of the skull that's called the occiput. The skull consists of the cranium and the facial skeleton. The cranium is the bony container for the brain and the foundation for the facial skeleton. The cranium is made up of a number of originally separate bones. These lines of fusion, known as sutures, show where the bones are joined. The principal bones that form the cranium are the occipital bone behind and below, the parietal bone and temporal bone on each side, the sphenoid bone and the frontal bone. The two bones of the cranium that we're concerned with at present are the occipital bone and the lower part of the adjoining temporal bone. To see the full extent of the occipital bone, we'll take the mandible out of the picture. The occipital bone extends all the way from here at the back to here underneath. The most striking feature of the occipital bone is this large opening, the foramen magnum, through which the spinal cord and its accompanying structures pass. The part of the occipital bone in front of the foramen magnum is called the basilar part, often referred to as the base of the occiput. The two temporal bones converge on it from each side. We'll look at them in a minute. Let's look at the occipital bone on the inside in a skull that's been divided in the midline. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the basilar part of the occipital bone. It slopes forwards and upwards, more steeply on the inside than on the underside, since it's triangular in sagittal section. Let's look at some more details in a skull that hasn't been colored. On each side of the anterior half of the foramen magnum, are the two occipital condyles. The occipital condyles are the joint surfaces which articulate with the atlas vertebra to form the atlanto-occipital joints. We'll look at these joints in a minute. The outline of the front and the top of the cranium is well known to us from our everyday observation of surface anatomy. It's perhaps surprising to see how far round the back of the cranium curves and what an extensive overhang there is behind. The overhang is formed by the part of the occipital bone that's behind the foramen magnum, the squamous part. The overhang is obscured by the neck muscles that are attached to this broad area on the occipital bone. 
the bone bears the marks of their attachment. This lump in the middle is the external occipital protuberance. This faint ridge, leading out toward the mastoid process, is the superior nuchal line. Below it is the inferior nuchal line. We'll meet the structures that are attached here later in this section. Now that we've looked at the occipital bone, let's take a look at the temporal bone. It's quite a complicated bone. To see its full extent, we'll again remove the mandible. The temporal bone goes from here on the outside to here underneath. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is the squamous part. A prominent feature of the temporal bone is this large projection, the mastoid process. As we'll see, it's the origin of some of the muscles that move the head, including the sternocleidomastoid. It's easy to feel the mastoid process here, behind and below the ear. While we're getting introduced to the temporal bone, we'll take a first look at some of its other important features, which we'll appreciate in later sections of these two tapes. We'll also meet some of the small openings through which important blood vessels, nerves and other structures enter and leave the cranium. There are many of these openings. Here, we'll just look at the openings on the outside of the temporal and occipital bones. This is the zygomatic arch, formed largely by the temporal bone and partly by the adjoining zygomatic bone. Here on the underside of the root of the zygomatic arch, this complex curved surface articulates with the condyle of the mandible to form the temporomandibular joint. This is the external auditory meatus leading to the middle ear. This long, sharp projection is the styloid process. Just at the base of the styloid is the little stylomastoid foramen for the facial nerve. Medial to the styloid process are two major openings for blood vessels. The carotid canal passing forwards for the internal carotid artery and the jugular foramen passing backwards for the internal jugular vein. Just above the occipital condyle is the hypoglossal canal for the hypoglossal nerve. Let's take a brief look at the occipital and temporal bones from the inside. Here's the squamous part of the occipital bone. Here's the basilar part. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the squamous part of the temporal bone. Here's the petrous part, which contains the structures of the inner and middle ear. Here's the jugular foramen on the inside. This big groove behind it is for the sigmoid sinus, the main venous drainage channel for the brain. Below and medial to the jugular foramen is the hypoglossal canal. Above the jugular foramen is the internal auditory meatus for the vestibulocochlear and facial nerves. The carotid canal ends here at the foramen lacerum, as we'll see in the next section. Now we've looked at the part of the skull that we're concerned with in this section. We'll move on now to look at the bones below it. First, we'll look at the special features of the first two cervical vertebrae, the atlas and the axis. Then we'll look at the continuity of the cervical spine with the bones of the upper part of the trunk. Here's the atlas, here's the axis. These two vertebrae are adapted to allow movement of the head. Forward flexion and extension of the head take place up here at the atlanto-occipital joints. Lateral flexion of the head takes place at these joints too. Rotation of the head, together with the atlas, happens here at the joints between the atlas and the axis, the atlanto-axial joints.
Because of their special functions, the atlas and the axis differ in several ways from typical cervical vertebrae. As we've seen in Volume 3, a typical cervical vertebra has a body in front and a neural arch behind, enclosing the vertebral foramen. It has a spinous process behind with two tuberosities and a transverse process on each side also with two tuberosities. On each side there are two articular surfaces, one above and one below, which form the intervertebral joints. The articular surfaces slope upward and forward. They're connected by this mass of bone, the articular pillar. Each vertebra is joined to its neighbors by an intervertebral disc in front and by two intervertebral joints behind, one on each side. Now let's look at ways in which the atlas and the axis are different. The atlas vertebra doesn't have a body. In front, it just has this narrow anterior arch, which matches the posterior arch. The two arches of the atlas, together with these two lateral masses, enclose an unusually large vertebral foramen. This part is occupied by the spinal cord, this part by the odontoid process of the axis, which we'll meet in a moment. The upper articular surfaces of the atlas are shaped like parts of the inside of a cup to match the shape of the occipital condyles. The lower articular surfaces of the atlas are shaped like parts of the inside of a cone. Now let's look at the axis vertebra. The body of the axis is prolonged by this important projection, the odontoid process. In terms of development, the odontoid process represents the missing body of the atlas. In terms of function, it's the pivot around which the head, together with the atlas, rotates. The upper articular surfaces of the axis are placed well in front of the lower ones. The upper surfaces are in a straight line with the odontoid process. As rotation occurs between these surfaces and those of the atlas, the odontoid process stays in the middle. The odontoid process is surrounded in front and on each side by bone. It's held in place behind by a strong ligament, the transverse ligament of the atlas. The odontoid process is also held in place from above by two strong ligaments, the alar ligaments, which are attached here and here. We'll see these ligaments shortly. The odontoid process has two small articular surfaces, one behind for the transverse ligament and one in front for the anterior arch of the atlas. To see how these structures relate to the base of the skull, we'll take an inside look from behind at a specimen in which the neural arches and the back of the occipital bone have been removed. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the inside of the basal part of the occipital bone. Here's the atlas. Here's the axis. Here's the odontoid process. Here are the atlanto-occipital joints and the atlanto-axial joints. Now that we've seen the atlas and the axis, we'll look at the bones below them that are involved in support and movement of the head. The lowest cervical vertebra, the seventh, articulates with the highest of the twelve thoracic vertebrae. The two first ribs slope downward and forward from the first thoracic vertebra. The costal cartilages of the first two ribs articulate here with the upper part of the sternum, the manubrium. The manubrium, the first ribs, and the body of the first thoracic vertebra form the margins of this opening, the superior thoracic aperture, through which many important structures pass. To complete our picture of the bones in this section, we'll add the clavicles and the scapulae. On each side, the clavicle articulates with the highest part of the manubrium to form the sternoclavicular joint. 
the sternocleidomastoid muscle is inserted here. The scapula is attached to the clavicle here at the acromioclavicular joint. In addition, the scapula is held in place by powerful muscles, the highest of which, the trapezius, arises here on the skull and is inserted here. Now let's move on to look at the ligaments that connect the skull and the cervical vertebrae. Like ligaments elsewhere in the body, these structures hold the bones together, permit the bones to move in relation to one another, and set limits to their movements. We'll look first at the structures that permit movement between individual vertebrae, the intervertebral discs and the intervertebral joints. Then we'll look at three ligaments that run the length of the cervical spine, the nuchal ligament and the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. Lastly, we'll look at the special ligaments around the odontoid process. Here's what the cervical spine looks like in the living body. Here are the spinous processes, the articular pillars, the transverse processes, and the vertebral bodies. The intervertebral joints are here. They're synovial joints. To get a better look at them, we'll make a cut through the articular pillars along this line. As with all synovial joints, each bony surface is covered by a layer of smooth articular cartilage. The space between the cartilages is filled with lubricating synovial fluid. The fluid is contained within a fibrous joint capsule, which permits movement. Between each vertebral body and its neighbor, there is an intervertebral disc. To see the discs, we'll make a cut in the midline. The discs are made of fibro cartilage that's attached firmly to the vertebra above and below. The fibrous joints formed by the discs permit only a little movement between the regular cervical vertebrae. The movements that can occur between these vertebrae are forward flexion, extension, and a twisting movement that's a combination of rotation and lateral flexion. In the intervals between the occiput, the atlas and the axis, where so much movement occurs, there are no discs, only synovial joints. Now we'll look at the three ligaments that run the length of the cervical spine, starting with the nuchal ligament. Here's the nuchal ligament, also called the ligamentum nuchi. It's a sheet of strong fibrous tissue that extends from the spinous process of the first thoracic vertebra to the external occipital protuberance. The nuchal ligament limits forward flexion of the head and the cervical spine. It also serves as the attachment for some major muscles. Next we'll go around to the front to see the anterior longitudinal ligament. This broad band is the anterior longitudinal ligament. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column, connecting the fronts of the vertebral bodies. It ends up here, at this tubercle on the arch of the atlas. The anterior longitudinal ligament is not as impressive in the neck as it is lower down. In the neck, the ligament that's impressive is the posterior longitudinal ligament, which runs down the backs of the vertebral bodies inside the vertebral canal. To see the posterior longitudinal ligament, will remove the arches of the vertebrae and also the back of the skull along this line. The spinal cord and the brain have been removed together with the covering layer of dura. Here's the base of the occiput. Here's the foramen magnum. Here are the divided vertebral arches. This is the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's much broader and thicker here in the neck than it is lower down the spine. The highest part of this ligament goes by a different name. It's called the tectorial membrane. To get a different view of it, we'll look at a specimen that's been divided in the midline. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the anterior arch of the atlas. Here's the odontide process.
Here's the tectorial membrane. It's attached to the base of the occiput and to the body of the axis. Continuing as the posterior longitudinal ligament, it's attached to the backs of the vertebral bodies all the way down the spine. Now we'll look at the ligaments which hold the odontoid process in place, making it the stable pivot round which rotation of the head occurs. We'll see the transverse ligament of the atlas, the cruciform ligament, which the transverse ligament is part of, and the ailer ligaments. To see them, we'll go back to the previous rear view and remove the tectorial membrane. Directly beneath the tectorial membrane is this strong and important ligament, the transverse ligament of the atlas. The transverse ligament is attached on each side to these two tubercles on the atlas. The transverse ligament prevents the odontoid process from being displaced backwards. A slender ligament, the superior band, runs upward from the transverse ligament to the base of the occiput. Another one, the inferior band, runs downward to the body of the axis. These, along with the transverse ligament of the atlas, are referred to collectively as the cruciform ligament. We'll remove all of the cruciform ligament to see the odontoid process and the ailer ligaments. Here's the odontoid process. Here are the massive ailer ligaments. They pass from here on the odontoid process to here on the inside of the occipital condyles. The ailer ligaments limit rotation of the head, especially in lateral flexion. Here's the side view again. Here's the tectorial membrane. Here in front of it is the divided transverse ligament of the atlas. It's quite an impressive structure. Lastly, we'll look at the ligaments that connect the vertebral arches. The arches of the regular cervical vertebrae are held together by strips of yellow fiber cartilage, known collectively as the ligamentum flavum. The arches of the axis and the atlas and the edges of the foramen magnum are held together by these loose and flexible sleeves of fibrous tissue, the atlanto-occipital and atlanto-axial ligaments. We've looked at a lot of anatomy already. Before we move on to look at the muscles, let's review what we've seen of the bones, joints and ligaments of this very fundamental part of the head and neck. Here's the occipital bone and the temporal bone. Here are the basal part and the squamous part of the occipital bone. The foramen magnum, the occipital condyles, the external occipital protuberance, the superior and inferior nuchal lines. On the temporal bone, Here's the petrous part and the squamous part. Here are the mastoid process, the zygomatic arch, and the surface for the temporomandibular joint. Here's the external auditory meatus and the styloid process. The stylomastoid foramen the carotid canal, the jugular foramen, and the hypoglossal canal. On a typical cervical vertebra, here's the body, the neural arch, the vertebral foramen, the spinous process, the transverse processes, the articular surfaces and the articular pillar. On the atlas vertebra, here's the anterior arch, the posterior arch, and the lateral bodies. On the axis vertebra, here's the odontoid process. Here are the intervertebral joints and the intervertebral discs.
Here are the atlanto-occipital and atlanto-axial joints. Here's the nuchal ligament, the anterior longitudinal ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the tectorial membrane. Here's the cruciform ligament, consisting of the transverse ligament of the atlas, the superior band, and the inferior band. And here are the two alar ligaments. Now we'll look at the principal muscles of the neck. We'll build up our picture from the inside to the outside. We'll start with four short muscles on the underside of the occiput, the two oblique muscles and the two rectus muscles. Collectively, these are called the suboccipital muscles. Here are the two rectus capitis muscles, minor and major. Rectus capitis minor goes from the middle of the posterior arch of the atlas to this area on the occiput. Rectus capitis major goes from the spinous process of the atlas to here on the occiput. Here are the two oblique or obliquus capitis muscles, the inferior and the much smaller superior. The inferior oblique goes from the spine of the axis vertebra to the transverse process of the atlas. The superior oblique goes from the transverse process of the atlas to here on the occiput. The action of the suboccipital muscles is to extend the head and to rotate it toward the same side. Next we'll go round to the front to see the longus muscles and the scalene muscles. Here are the longus muscles, longus cervices here, merging with longus capitis higher up. Longus capitis arises from the base of the occiput and inserts on the transverse processes of C3, 4 and 5. Longus cervices arises from the bodies of C1 to 4 and inserts on the bodies of the vertebrae from C5 all the way down to T4. Longus capitis and cervices are weak flexors of the head and cervical spine. Next we'll add the three scalene muscles to the picture. The anterior scalene, middle scalene, and posterior scalene. They arise from the transverse processes of the lower five cervical vertebrae. The anterior scalene from the anterior tubercles, the middle and posterior scalene from the posterior tubercles. The anterior and middle scalene muscles insert on the first rib. The posterior scalene inserts on the first and second ribs. The scalene muscles are involved not in movements of the neck, but in elevating the upper ribs in deep inspiration. The scalene muscles have important relationships to the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus, shown in volume one of this atlas. Now we'll add the clavicles and the scapulae to the picture and go round to the back again to look at three large muscles that shape the back of the neck, semispinalis, splenius, and trapezius. We'll add semispinalis to the picture first. Here's semispinalis. It arises by many tendons of origin from the articular processes of C4 to C7 and from the transverse processes of T1 to T6. Semispinalis runs almost vertically to insert here on the occiput, just behind the two rectus muscles. The action of semispinalis is to extend the head. In addition, when we're upright or leaning forward, the tonic action of semispinalis prevents gravity from flexing the head. Next we'll add splenius to the picture. Here's splenius. It's a broad strap of muscle which arises from the spinous processes of T3 to C7 and from the lower half of the nuchal ligament. Splenius passes upward and laterally to insert in the lateral half of the superior nuchal line 
and on the back of the mastoid process. Splenius assists in rotating the head toward the same side. This muscle besides splenius is levator scapulae, which is shown in volume one of this atlas. Lastly, we'll add trapezius to the picture. Here's trapezius. Trapezius is a large and complex muscle. As shown in volume one, its lower part extends all the way down to T12. Here we're concerned only with its upper part. The upper part of trapezius arises from the medial part of the superior nuchal line and from the nuchal ligament. Its fibers fan out downward and laterally to insert on the spine of the scapula, the acromion, and the lateral third of the clavicle. The trapezius muscles largely define the shape and outline of the neck, both from behind, here are the two trapezius muscles, and from in front. This is trapezius again. Trapezius is thought of mainly as a shoulder muscle. Its upper part raises the scapula. In addition, when the scapula is held steady by the action of other muscles, trapezius acts in the same way as semispinalis, in extending the head and in keeping the head upright when we lean forward. The last muscle to add to our picture is the sternocleidomastoid. Here it is. It arises from here on the mastoid process and just behind it. The sternocleidomastoid muscle runs downwards, forwards, and medially to insert partly on the medial end of the clavicle and partly on the manubrium. Contraction of one sternocleidomastoid muscle produces rotation of the head toward the opposite side. Contraction of both sternocleidomastoids together produces flexion of the head and cervical spine. When we're leaning backwards, their tonic action prevents gravity from extending the head and neck. The tendons of insertion of the two sternocleidomastoid muscles, together with the medial ends of the clavicles, define this hollow in the lower part of the neck. Now we've seen the principal muscles that produce movements of the head and neck. Let's review the muscles that we've seen. Here's rectus capitis minor and major and obliquus capitis inferior and superior. Here's longus capitis and longus cervices. Here are the scalene muscles, anterior, middle, and posterior. Here's semispinalis, splenius, and trapezius. And here's the sternocleidomastoid. That brings us to the end of this section on support and movement of the head.